Real men are providers. Let me tell you what a real woman is. Not argumentative, angry, and bitchy. So what you're doing with me then? Honestly, what are you guys even doing together still? It's never made sense. And you know what else doesn't make sense? Patrick's dad. Então, nós foi no sítio de Zé ontem para poder olhar lá, né, para ver se a gente ia fazer a festa lá, que a gente queria. É, não é que será que Zé <laughs> tem coragem de cobrar do próprio filho dele? Yeah, you know it's gonna be bad if Carlos has to get involved. But before we get to that very tense first meeting between parents, let's start with our favourite dysfunctional couple, Gino and Jasmine. So we left the pair after what felt like a fever dream. Jasmine accused Gino of having a porn addiction, but it seems like rather than address or give credence to that claim, Gino prefers to just ignore it. But he doesn't want to talk about it anymore. So here we are at the playing store, avoiding and avoiding and avoiding the real problems in our relationship. Ignore, ignore, avoid, avoid. I mean, f***ing hell. It's all sounding very familiar at this point, isn't it? I mean, you know things are bad. You know they're really scraping the bottom of the barrel over at TLCHQ. If we've got to the stage where we're joining Gino and Jasmine shopping for home appliances. Like, Jesus Christ, maybe it's time for these two to just get off our screens already. Now, as expected, like clockwork, as Gino's doing his best to save money on a new dryer, Jasmine takes her opportunity to complain. Why is it that you can afford to replace our broken dryer? I mean, dear God, please, please save us the scene next week if she doesn't get her dryer. Yeah, where the mother but anyway, she continues, why is it that you can afford that, but you can't afford my beauty pageant entry? To which Gino shocks her by saying, actually, hold your horses, Miss Bossy Boots. I went to see my Uncle Marco and he gave me some sound advice. You be the bigger person, it's gonna show her that you love her. Let her go in the pageant. It'll be one less thing that you're arguing about. Gino tells us that his uncle's advice means a lot to him. His uncle is basically a father figure since his own dad died. So now that Uncle Marco has told him he should enter Jasmine into the beauty pageant, Gino has gone ahead and taken the leap. He's done it, seemingly not because he promised Jasmine he'd do it, but because his uncle told him to. I know it's something that you wanted, and I booked the pageant, and I paid the 1200 fee for the pageant, basically using our credit card. Uh, today. Well, hey, she's got what she wants. So is Jasmine happy? No, of course she's not happy. This is Jasmine we're talking about. Come on, you know better than that. She's happy for like half a second and then Gino just doesn't shut up. He keeps going on and on. He keeps talking. He doesn't know how to keep his mouth shut. In typical Gino fashion, he says to her, this money I've just spent on you comes with expectations and stipulations. And <laughs> just look at Jasmine roll her eyes. So what is it that Gino wants? Well, again, call it deja vu. I'm pretty sure we've seen this a thousand times before, but Gino begs her, please, please stop arguing with me. Please stop saying hurtful things things to me. Stop making fun of my sex drive and my porn addiction. I'm give you this, you know, but you have to do this. Like he's trying to condition me. And this manipulative psychology that is used to train dogs. To be fair, Jasmine, if he's treating you like a dog, maybe it means he actually listened to you last week. No, no creature on earth, except for my dog, is ever gonna control me. So maybe that's why he's treating you like a dog. Either that, or maybe he hopes a dog might show him a little bit more appreciation. Yeah, appreciation. Like a bad dream, a bad nightmare. That age-old topic for an argument again resurfaces. See guys, take note. This is what happens when you don't actually resolve anything. Ignore, 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 and it just comes back. For what feels like the millionth time, Gino tells Jasmine, you never appreciate anything I do for you. Because you'll never thank me for anything I've done No, for you. thank you, Gino. I want to make sure you give me all the credit I deserve for busting my ass, first of all, to get you to this country on the K-1. I mean, come on, Gino, let it lie, mate. Jesus Christ. He's brought it up again. He's brought up the K-1 visa yet again. 
It keeps hovering it over Jasmine as if it's something that she needs to be eternally grateful for. He'll never let her forget it by the looks of things. And while don't get me wrong, Jasmine could definitely learn to show a bit of gratitude. At the same time, if we're getting tired hearing this, then I can't imagine how she feels. Actually, wait, wait, hold on, scratch that. I can imagine how she feels because she now takes the opportunity to make it abundantly clear what she thinks a real real man, a real husband, should be doing for her. Real men are providers. Let me tell you what a real woman is, and not argumentative, angry, and bitchy. So what are you doing with me then? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. It's one maybe the two of you should have thought of years ago, before you got married perhaps. If those aren't the qualities that he wants in a woman, then why the hell is he with Jasmine? I mean, it's not like she's changed her personality overnight. She's been like this from the very start. Like, she's always been angry, argumentative, and, <laughs> well, bitchy. But, on the other hand, Gino has changed. When she met him, she thought that he was a sugar daddy. She thought he'd be whisking her off to private islands every week. Yeah, that hasn't worked out as she planned, has it? Here they are in Michigan, shopping for budget dryers. I'm his wife, and he's not God. He's <laughs> bald men. So where do they go from here? Is Jasmine gonna suddenly change everything about her personality and bow down and kiss his feet? Wait, <laughs> don't answer that question. They're not dirty. Yeah, sorry, sorry, unfortunate phrasing there. Anyway, moving swiftly on. Let's talk about another couple that, frankly, they're also beginning to get on my nerves. Can you sense a theme today? Jeez, this season is really dragging on, isn't it? So, we join Emily and Kobe. As the married couple, yeah, it's very important to point that out, they're already married, they already have kids, but they're trying to drag a storyline out of this. So, the married couple are waiting for an ex-girlfriend that Kobe dated years ago to show up. Only, thank God, that lady has more sense than to be embroiled into this stupid storyline. I mean, it's already 4.15. What time did you tell her she would be here? I told her to be here like 4 o'clock. I don't know what's going on. Look, Kobe doesn't really look too bummed that his ex is late. And can you really blame him? Who in their right mind would want to meet up with an ex all these years later to drag up the past? Like, frankly, it's a miracle that Emily or production or whoever it might be has roped him into this and he's even playing along for good measure. It just all feels like a non-story. So much of their storyline this year feels so forced. Oh my God, babe, it's really getting late and I don't know if she's gonna show up. I texted her the time and the location and I told her that my wife was gonna be there. You know, maybe that's why she's not showing up. So the ex doesn't show up, but Emily is still determined to get answers. She looks her husband in the eye and she asks him, when did you actually break up with your ex? And judging by how uncomfortable Kobe is, judging by the fact he can't even look her in the eye, it seems it might not be quite that straightforward. We never officially said, okay, what's over? When you got pregnant, I was like, okay, I, did, I gotta focus on this. This is my life now. Right, so the words, we're over, it's done, we're finished, or anything of that sort, weren't actually uttered. And while that might sound bad, keep in mind, just to add context to that, at the time, Kobe was in China. His ex was back in Cameroon. It was a long-distance relationship. Like, it's really not uncommon for long-distance relationships just to fade away. It happens. We just stopped communicating, Kobe tells her. Like, it's definitely not ideal, and I guess technically speaking, Kobe's friend wasn't lying. Kobe was officially at least still in a relationship when he got Emily pregnant. But what Emily asks him next really pisses him off. She asks him, were you in love with your ex when you met me? And Kobe doesn't answer. He gets really flustered. He says to Emily, I was in China f***ing around, living a good life. Stop asking me these questions. I don't ask you, and I quote, how many men you f***ed before you met me. So My why life. wouldn't you end it with her when you were already seeing other people? Well, because at that point, I didn't know of when I was going to come back to Cameroon. And I was just living my life. 
Emily tries to make Kobe understand that what he did to his ex wasn't right. You just kept her as a backup option, she says to him. You didn't dump her, but you kept her there just in case someone else didn't come along. And Kobe actually agrees. He says, yeah, I guess if you want to call it that, then that's what I did. It's not nice. It's not clever. It's not the right way to treat someone. But Kobe takes accountability. But that still doesn't change the fact that it's not actually Emily that he should be apologising to. Not really. Now, Emily still doesn't let up. As though that didn't answer the question already, she continues to ask Kobe, were you in love with this woman? I was not in love with her. I mean... Okay. Got it. I want to ask you one question. Do you think I love you? I know you love me. Okay, then why are you bringing that up? I mean, no offence, Emily, but obviously he didn't love her. Like, he's just admitted how badly he treated her. That's not what you do to someone that you love. Now, having finally heard the words out of his mouth, that seems to be enough for Emily to drop the topic, at least for today. But she warns Kobe, this has all been a big eye-opener for me, and I now don't entirely trust you, I think she's saying. Why did you lie about it? And why did you drag it out so long? Like, why not just tell me the truth when I brought it up to you after Valerie said it? Now I have doubts. Look, as far as I'm concerned, Kobe has more than proved he's a loving husband and a good dad. Don't make this a thing, Emily. Just let sleeping dogs lie. Now, moving on, over in Brazil, we join Patrick Tyson, of course, John, in the car ride back home. We're coming back from my dad's ranch, and we're hoping to have Elise's party there because it's so beautiful, but he wants us to renovate it before anyone shows up. All three of them, including Patrick, agree that hosting the party at Jose's house isn't a good idea. They just can't justify all the extra renovation costs that it would entail. And even though Patrick isn't willing to spend that money, he falls short of agreeing with Thais and John that his dad is just taking advantage of him. He's family, that's what family do, he says. And perhaps his stance makes a bit more sense when we learn about his mum. My mom passed away a few months ago after a three-year battle with cancer. And my relationship with my mom probably more complicated, you know, than my dad. Patrick readily admits that his mum's passing has affected his relationship with his dad. Time's precious, he says. I have no problem helping him. I'm just glad to have him in my life. Now, Thais tries to convince Patrick that what his dad is asking from him isn't normal. My dad would never do what your dad just did, she says. And John agrees. John says, you've already helped your dad out enough. Why does he feel like it's okay to charge for a party for his own granddaughter? I think Zay's taking out the manners. You are paying more than... Uh, 20,000 for per year. It seems like, you know, the best move might be to split ways with the pot. 20,000 a year, Tai says, is way more than the going rent in Brazil. Let the apartment go. We barely visit it anyway. This is the first time in over two years. But Patrick doesn't agree. He says there's sentimental value in the property. Now, truthfully, I think that's just an excuse. He might say it's for sentimental reasons, but I think deep down, Patrick knows his dad relies on that money. That's the real reason he pays rent. Either way, wherever the truth lies, when we join them later on, they reveal that they've organised a dinner with both sides of the family coming together to meet for the very first time. Yeah, <laughs> Carlos and Patrick, Jose and John, all of the tense relationships already. I, I can't imagine what could possibly go wrong. This is the first time ever that we are having our family together, so we are nervous. Yeah, especially for my dad to meet your dad. So as they all drive to dinner, Patrick and Thais discuss how they really hope their dads can be friends. But <laughs> I wouldn't hold my breath if I were you. Even John, sitting in the back seat, seems to really have his doubts. And as the trio arrive at the restaurant, the first people to show up are Patrick's dad, closely followed by Thais's mum. My mum, you know, left me. It made me feel, you know, a little angry. But I think now, after Lisi, we have a better relationship. 
After my parents' divorce, my mum really wasn't involved in my life, Thais reveals. We're only now starting to rebuild bridges. Now, despite this, the dinner actually starts out great. John turns out to be the comedic relief that this tense dynamic really needs. He starts shouting at everyone to try and get his point across, given that he can't speak Portuguese. And in true John fashion, he just makes everyone laugh. Ah, mother! Ah, brother! <laughs> the vibes are good, and they stay good when Thais's dad arrives. <laughs> Carlos is getting some laughs, he's making fun of John, it's all good natured and it's all at John's expense, but John doesn't understand anyway, so all is good, the vibe is happy, but things suddenly take a turn when Thais announces to the group that this is actually a test run. She's using this dinner to see if they can all behave themselves ahead of Elise's party. Yeah, Elise's party. Então nós foi no sítio de Zé ontem para poder olhar lá, né, para ver se a gente ia fazer a festa lá, que a gente queria. É, não é que será que Zé tem coragem de cobrar do próprio dele? Yikes. Carlos clearly isn't afraid to air dirty laundry at the table, is he? But is humiliating Jose, is getting involved in his business really the right thing to do at the first ever family meeting? Like, we already know that Carlos is a man with a lot of pride. Pride that Patrick has hurt. So will the whole family dynamic only get worse if and when Jose inevitably bites back? Oh, Carlos. Isso aí não é negócio não, bicho. Pera aí, cara. 